In version 1.0 of 20 Minutes into the Future, Ed Ward, veteran journalist and music critic, talks about the future of music with Plutopia News Network's John Lebkowski and Scoop Sweeney. So today we're going to be talking to Ed Ward. Anybody who's listened to NPR's Fresh Air will know Ed as their rock and roll historian. He's been on there since 1986. He's also one of the original founders of the South by Southwest Music Festival, which is uh, so big a part of Austin's scene every March. Ed uh, used to be based in Berlin uh, from like 1993 to 2008, and then he moved to Montpellier, France. And he's Skyping in from Montpellier, France right now as we speak. In addition to his uh, history lessons on fresh air, He's also contributed to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and all sorts of music magazines. And he also has a blog, a really great blog, called City on a Hill, which is at wardenfrance.blogspot.com. Ed writes about food, and he writes about music. So in this inaugural Plutopia podcast, we'll talk about the future of both. So, Ed, how are you doing? Oh, you know, okay. Great to talk to you today. It's a little cold and somewhat rainy here, which is unusual, but, um, well, it's coming on to winter, so that's what happens. How is it living in France as an expatriate? Well, it's not terribly different from what it was like living in Germany as an expatriate. It's um, just the food is better. (laughs) Oh, I bet it's a lot better. Yeah, it is a lot better, Um, or at least... As far as my taste is concerned, see that that's the whole thing is it's different from taking a vacation. You got to live there, you know. You've got to worry about things like whether the garbage gets picked up and uh, yeah, you know, the, the, whether you can afford the phone bill, things like that. So, what's the future like for people who decide they want to live as expatriates for a, like an extended time in some other country? Well, they've got to be very careful choosing the country correctly because, like I said, it's not a vacation. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I know a couple here that does web design, and um, they work at night as part of an English language, um, an English school in Japan. He's he's Canadian, she's Japanese, and they work for this school um, that prepares kids for the uh, the standardized Japanese English test. And they live here because they like it here. And also, they can do their work during the day, send it off to Japan. Japan wakes up, and there's the work. Then Japan gets its stuff together, sends it off. They wake up here, and there it is. I suppose there's a lot of jobs like this that where it kind of doesn't matter where you live. You can live pretty much anywhere. And now you can even have uh, a really strong community of friends all over the world, no matter where you are. Yeah, although having real live friends is uh, also very important. And uh, that's one of the things I, you know, I, I wound up doing in Berlin actually several times. You said something on your blog uh, just recently about how you'd been kind of sitting in at the the English store where you were hanging out to use their internet feed and they started asking you to kind of cover the store and you were starting to meet people. Are you only just now starting to to make connections like social connections in Montpellier? Well, to some extent, yes. Uh, um, you tend to know some people when you move into a place and, and uh, sometimes that doesn't necessarily work out. And so... Um, yeah, I, I just realized that I needed to meet a different different types of people. And sitting in a store where people randomly come in, that's, that's an ideal situation for that. So uh, you're an immigrant in France. Do you ever see people out carrying signs saying, immigrant, go home? Well, no, because <laughs> they wouldn't be aiming that at me. They'd be aiming that towards my neighbors. One interesting thing about living here is that I've totally lost my fear of Islam. I've also got Moroccan and Tunisian neighbors, and uh, I know there's a huge Gabonais community here from Gabon. I don't know why, but there they are. Um, And yeah, I mean, it's really funny too, because um, I've had some really good uh, 
some some really good interactions with with these people. The guy downstairs runs a Lebanese snack bar that's just amazingly good. And the day my stuff arrived from Germany with these two incompetent German guys who weren't really professional movers, they ran out of time and they just dumped my stuff in the street and took off because they had to catch a ferry in Barcelona. And I was just despairing. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I, it, <laughs> heavy stuff and I'm not as young as I once was. And, and uh, the guy at the snack bar said, do you need help with that? I said, yeah. And he whips out his cell phone and he called his friend Ali who showed up and Ali worked just, I mean, like a machine. He was amazing. Little tiny guy who was just completely muscle. And he just wrestled all those boxes of books and stuff up the stairs. And, and I helped him with a couple pieces of furniture, but mostly, you know, he didn't really need my help. He was just humping stuff. So the Muslims actually saved my life the day I moved here. And uh, it's been like that ever since. I had a, uh, a next door neighbor, a Moroccan kid, who was a business student. Um, and uh, he was really great. He was very curious about America and, and curious about uh, a lot of stuff. And uh, when my internet went out earlier this year, he just said, I'll just hook up onto my network. So um, that's been, it's been very interesting learning about that. And, you know, once again, this is a, a culture I wouldn't have seen in Germany. In the U.S. right now, there's a real paranoia about Muslims and there's a, a sort of commonly held belief, at least among some in this country, um, that they're violent people and that their, their uh, goal is to kill us all, I guess. Uh, do you hear that in France? Are there people in France who are really paranoid about Muslims? Sure. There's uh, uh, Pierre Le Pen and his uh, Front National, but every European country has an extreme right-wing um, party and and uh, because of the fact that people aren't scared of yet another thing Americans are scared of socialism um, social democratic government is um, pretty much normal I mean it's considered pretty mainstream um, and yet even the conservative parties like even Angela Merkel's party in Germany is to the left of America's Democratic Party well do people in France like vote, do they tend to get out the vote pretty well? I'm not sure. In Germany, I know it's it's considered really, really not done not to vote. I mean, they, they, they're they pulling out 85, 90% uh, voter turnout on, on election day. And you can probably figure out the rest of those people are sick or disabled or something or too old or, you know, the, the ones that who are... Um, apathetic there just aren't any apathetic people if nothing else you you know shuffle down to the the place where the uh, the polling place and, and um, just cast your routine vote for the people you've always voted for and go home um, I haven't actually been through an election here although while I was coming over here frequently to look for a place I did see the Sarkozy campaign going along and um, and yet, once again, there's somebody who is considered a, a real right winger in France, who is in many ways to the left of Obama. And uh, certainly if the Socialist Party weren't in such disarray, they'd probably be running the country now. And of course, that does have its downside because it's got uh, the, the they're running out of money to uh, fund some of these wonderful social programs. And, and that's the same problem that everybody seems to have at the moment. Well, I know that's an interesting question there. That is this a global problem in the in the U.S. Certainly, governments don't have money. Ordinary people don't have money. There seem to be a few people who have piles of money, but we most do. people and most institutions don't. Yeah, that's that's true. But um, here it's a little bit different because of the fact that there is an entrenched socialist bureaucracy, so that a lot of the, I mean, some of it. One, I, I, I feel really terrible defending Sarkozy, but um, <laughs> he was absolutely right in, in these strikes that we just had. I, I put up a couple of pictures on the blog, and I certainly saw stuff that was far more spectacular than that a couple of weeks later. I, I saw a line of people. There must have been 20,000, 30,000 people marching into town, coming off of the buses. They were all coming from the bus stop. And um, 
they were protesting Sarkozy's proposed bill to raise the retirement age from 60 to 62 and for post office employees from 55 to 57. And I was thinking, geez, I was going to turn 62 in a couple of weeks. And that, in fact, is um, hindering me looking for a place to uh, live. They can't believe that I'm self-employed and still uh, still working when I should be retired. I should, I'm should i at retirement age, or I'm two years past retirement age, except that the um, the government did pass the bill, and now people are just furious that they have to work till they're 62. Yeah, an interesting yeah. question about that in the U.S. They're talking about raising the uh, retirement age to 70. But if you're 60 or older, you really can't get a job here. Um, I don't know that anybody would admit that that problem exists because that's ageism. But uh, the fact is that people who are over 60 and unemployed are just out of luck. So uh, the question is, if, if the retirement age is raised to 70, does that mean that we're going to have a bunch of people who have to spend 10 years essentially unemployed, you know, unless they just happen to manage to hold on to some job that they have? which they probably can't because one way or another, they're probably going to be laid off or, or uh, terminated. Uh, and it, for, in my opinion, it's age related. Yeah, there's no, there's no question about that. Uh, as far as the States is concerned, there's, uh, I've certainly seen that in the music business where anybody who gets to be over 50 uh, pretty much gets uh, shown the door. Yes, yes. put out the pasture. Yeah, which is utterly ridiculous because, well, I mean, I know one guy who lost his job about three days after his 50th birthday. And um, so he, he did something really smart. He um, mentioned that he was going to set up a consultation company in his specialty. And all of the guys in his department who took over for him, mm -hmm. they signed mm -hmm. up for consultation. So for about a year there, he was making more money consulting the people who were doing his old job than he had made at his old job. Well, let's do talk about the music industry since you've been writing about music for uh, as long as I can remember. Since I was 16. Yeah, and that's, that's unfortunately a very long time, right? <laughs> well, uh, so, so in, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Ed, the uh, statement you made about uh, older people in the music industry being, uh, superfluous now do you think that is uh, affecting uh, the quality of what we're seeing the quality of acts that are being developed is that uh, a good or a bad thing that the old people are being shown the door well that's a very complex question because the state of the music business right now is very complex and it's not at all like what it was the majority of the time that uh, i was involved with it. i'm far less involved with it now um, I don't listen to new music uh, of any sort, for the most part, and um, in fact, I don't listen to much music anymore because I just don't have, have time in the day for it, and I don't like having to listen through earphones. I think that's incredibly unnatural, and um, it's physically annoying, um, but that's a whole other issue. Um, I think that there is still plenty of music for older consumers it's just getting to it we have the same problems that an 18 year old or anybody who's beginning to develop taste out of the collage of stuff that's available has that as, as somebody i know once said we're living in an age of cultural overproduction and that's really true and the other part of that is that technology has made it possible that technology for that excuse me that cultural uh, overproduction to be very well done you can have really great recordings of your totally uninspired material you can also have great recordings of inspired material but when there are hundreds and thousands of albums coming out now to the extent that albums can be said to come out of course that which is another issue um, there's so much crap out there that nobody really knows how to get to stuff they're going to like. I gave up, frankly. I I, uh, I just didn't um, 
I didn't pursue stuff anymore because it was fruitless. If somebody got wind that you liked band A, you'd be getting faded Xerox copies of that band forever. You know, and here's a stack of, of CDs that I'd have to slog through. And I just gave up because it wasn't fun. It wasn't enjoyable. I I became far more passive. And when, when there were still publications that were paying for uh, record reviews, I would let them do most of the choosing on newly recorded product and see if I actually did like it. However, those magazines have all disappeared and no one gets paid for doing that anymore. So I basically don't do it anymore. I suppose in an era of digital convergence, when, when you have uh, so many channels and they're so fragmented, it's hard to conceive of a real top 40. I mean, what are you going to measure? How do you really know what people are listening to? I, I would, you know, almost, well, I would like to sit down and see a copy of Billboard and, and see what the charts are because what are they measuring? I mean, it's true. 50% of the income of the record business, independent and major now, is um, is still physical product. And I think that's, that's actually wonderful because I, I think that we need to maintain physical product. I think we need to maintain um, the physical artifact in music and in publishing and uh, wait for this sort of wave of neophilia to uh, abate, as I believe it will. Why, why do you think that that's important? Well, because there's so much information that, that um, you have access to when you've got a book or a magazine or a record. And people's need for that, that sort of information, it varies. And in my case, it's very, very high. Um, if I get a record, sometimes I need to know who engineered it. Sometimes I need to know who the bass player is. Often I need to know who wrote something. And then if that's the case, Sometimes I need to know who the music publisher is because I will know that the songwriter has a history that moved from place A to place B and that meant changing um, song publishers. So I look at, for instance, a Dylan song and I see who has the publishing on it and I know from what part of his career it comes. And that's, you know, that's important to me and I think that also, for somebody like like a Dylan fan, that would be really important. You know, people who tend to be obsessive or, or as I say, connoisseurs. Connoisseurship drives the industry, I believe. Those are the people who take um, product and conserve it. And th those are the people who make sure that stuff survives its initial period of uh, popularity and one of the things that's happened now though is is that um you've got this blockbuster mentality and the blockbuster mentality is all about quick burnout because you have to keep replacing these people because they're too expensive to keep uh, on long multi-decade careers while, while you've been talking i've been looking at the billboard top 10 and it's very interesting. The top 10 in uh, uh, the Hot 100 on the charts. That's the singles. There's a lot of hip hop in here. I, sure. Like a, like a G6 by the Far East Movement. Uh, Only Girl in the World by Rihanna. Uh, Just a Dream by Nelly. Uh, another Rihanna. Uh, the, the Glee cast is in here, too, and Katy Perry is in here, but it's very hip-hop and pop. And one of the interesting things about it is that you can play from from the Billboard site, you can play these these uh, tracks, or at least you can play snippets of them. And you can buy ringtones, and you can buy the track. Well, that, that's Billboard trying to make some money right there because they no longer have this incredibly expensive trade magazine that everybody used to rely on because the content is more 
easily available on the web. Right. So I, I would imagine this is a company that's in uh, a great crisis right now. Wouldn't surprise me at all. And if you hop over to the digital top 10, the number one is uh, the by the Glee cast, the cast of it. Do you know the television show Glee? Well, I know of it, yes. And so they produce a musical pretty much every week. Um, and then they release the soundtrack online. Yeah. At the same time that that they show the the, the episode, and uh, and they're a huge sellers now. Well, that, that's because that's a very intelligent way to market it. Um, TV has been a, a godsend for a lot of uh, independent musical artists. Just getting a, a snippet put onto a, a soundtrack of a popular show will uh, make you a great deal of money. And uh, it's probably one of the few ways that recorded artists um, make money from their recordings. There's all this talk about, you know, touring, but um, that's that's one of the things I really dislike is, is these people saying, oh, you know, give your music away, make your money on the road. Um, I happen to know an artist, I won't call his name, um, but he, he's really good and, and he's had moments of fame and he's, he's, made, he's made great records. And if, if somewhere along the line, he got married and started a family. And he no longer wants to be out on the road 11 months out of the year. He wants to be with his family. Um, he wants to keep his health up because he's not getting any younger. And I think that the, the mentality that says, you know, sell T-shirts and give your music away, that's, that's incredibly bad for people like him. There's also a lot of people who are what you might call bedroom artists. You know, these people, I'm saying that the technology's gotten better. They, they sit in their bedrooms and they play around with tracks and so forth. And how do you take that on the road? You know, you don't, even if you're popular. Um, there, I guess there's a way to wedge that into a DJ sort of situation, but I don't know. It, it, it just disturbs me. And, uh, and yet music continues to be important, uh, although I'm beginning to think that there's going to be a fade out. Many years ago, actually nine years ago, I was in Japan and uh, I came back. And I, I, I kept telling people, I said, you know, the next big thing might not be musical. The next big thing in youth culture might be cell phones. And people looked at me like I was speaking Martian. But, <laughs> hey, it's happened. Has it has it? happened. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Though the cell phones are actually uh, also uh, iPods in effect. I mean, you can play music on your cell phone. Sure. But but it's more than just a cell phone. I mean, it's a. Uh, it's not right. a phone anymore. It's a it's a device that does many things. It's a multimedia device, but it's also got you know text messaging, which is an incredible social binder for for teenagers, and uh, a lot of them are equipped so that you can do Twitter from them, and I think I think a lot of the twittering that goes on, um, is probably done from portable devices. Absolutely. So you know. Once again, I I, I think I, I I've never been a prophet before, and here I was suddenly. Well, are people making money from selling their music online, like through iTunes or through eMusic? What kind of deal do they get with eMusic? Now, somebody published a chart just recently, which shows these uh, little pie charts of how much money you, how how many units you have to sell on various platforms in order to um, in order to make minimum wage and um, it turned out that uh, you had to have you know hundreds of thousands of plays on Spotify in order to make an hour's minimum wage whereas you only had to sell I forget what about 58 CDs if you owned your own label, you know, if you a self-produced CD, you only had to make do 58 a week in order to make minimum wage. So it really is a question, you know, it's, it's 
what does getting played on Spotify mean? It, does it ever translate into sales? I, there's a lot of this needs to be researched or probably has been researched and I just don't know the answers. But once again, I, I'm pointing at the, the primacy of uh, physical product as a, a profit making device. I'm looking at that chart right now. To make minimum wage, you have to sell 143 self-pressed CDs, 155 CD albums, 1,161 retail albums with a high-end royalty deal, 1,229 album downloads from iTunes. Uh, and it goes on down. And then at the very bottom on streaming, you have to have 849,000 plays per month, almost 850,000 plays per month. On Spotify, right? I believe so. Well, it's on informationisbeautiful.net, the one that I'm looking at. Well, no, I mean, it may be the, the same one. The streaming. Oh, well, the yeah, streaming? So. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, Rhapsody streaming is what it mentions here. Right, Rhapsody. Uh, and then guess, last, last FM, on Last FM, it's 1,546,000 per month. Right. And on Spotify, it's 4,053,000 per month. And what's the odds of that, huh? Well, you know, a, a lot of that has to do with the whole RIAA clampdown on Internet streaming. That's why it's so hard to make any money because they are so restricted compared to terrestrial broadcasters and this whole uh you know the whole battle of the riaa against pretty much the rest of the world uh, and how do you think that has affected uh, the music industry well clearly they've been um depicted as bad guys and when you go sue a woman who's machine was maybe hijacked to download 700 illegal albums or whatever that, that case with that that woman and she lost which was just astonishing um yeah they're they're being uh well what they're doing is they're defending an industry that doesn't exist anymore they're defending the industry that michael jackson made so much money out of and and that's just not going to ever happen again it, it's not <laughs> Uh, because, you know, things have just changed. I mean, even Michael Jackson wasn't making that kind of money by the end of his life. He he was, um, he had made a lot of money, and so he had a lot of, you know, toys and stuff. And he was living pretty well, considering what he was having to pay out to doctors and so forth. But um, that was all, you know, pretty much on the back of Thriller and the fact that he was incredibly popular in Europe and could uh, sell out football stadiums for five days, which he did, uh, even towards the end of his life. So, um, but that, that industry doesn't exist anymore. The next Michael Jackson, somebody with that much talent and that much visual uh, presence, they're going to have a hard road to hoe because there's going to be thousands of other people competing exactly the same way and how, finding that person who is special has just been made incredibly more difficult. And I just don't have the time to keep up with it. And I wonder how many people do. I mean, even teenagers. When I first, when I first started st buying albums, uh, LPs in, um, you know, like the late 60s, I could almost keep up with, uh, with everything that was coming out. And I'm sure you famously know the record shop in Big Spring bought one of pretty much everything that came out. Right. And they were not, you know, they, they were a small, smallest store. Uh, they weren't completely full. Um, now, there's so much music out that has been recorded and released over the years, and it's all been digitized and it's all available. I mean, do we have a sort of commodification of music happening here where there's just, we're just saturated with it? There's just so much of it out there that, that anything that you add to it seems to do you have less value? Yeah, I, I, that's pretty much the way it looks to me. And and that it's really hard to um, to get heard because let's face it, if you're a pop band with you know four talented guys and and guitars, um, why would I buy your record against you know uh, as opposed to say a Beatles record or an album by The Shoes, which was a 
pop band from uh, Illinois that finally got rediscovered years after they recorded all their stuff. Or or Badfinger, whose stuff just came out on Apple in this, you know, Apple box, and um, who were considered too much like the Beatles when they started out and um, then turned into something entirely different when people started hearing them again. You know, it's like, oh, these this is a very good pop band that we forgot about. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you got those those kind of layers. I can buy the Beatles, I can buy Badfinger, I can buy the shoes, or I can buy your band, little boy. Um which am I going to do? Well, I've got the Beatles and I've got Badfinger and I, I, no, I guess I don't have the shoes, but I know where to get them. So I'm maybe a little more inclined to listen to your band, but, um, but I'm not actually, because there's nothing I can do for you. There's no place to write for. There's no place that'll pay me to do it. And I'm not going to do it for free because I can't sell t-shirts. So other than these, like top 10 hip hop artists that we were seeing on billboard a minute ago, who is making money making music? I mean, there are still so many bands making music and touring and, and, uh, uh, tons of music being released uh, all the time. Uh, are they making money or are they just doing it because they love to do it? I think, I think very few of them are making decent money. The ones who are have, uh, figured out various merchandising deals. It's merchandise and touring, which sells the records. I don't think many people who either sit at home because they can't tour because the nature of their art makes it impossible or because like the guy I was talking about, they just don't want to. I don't think they're making money. The guy I was talking about works um, as a stock clerk in a border store in an airport. You're talking about the hip hop too. There, there, there is a a culture where there is very definitely a love of physical product, and where people will buy a CD single with remixes on it, um, and forget about it in three weeks. But there you go. You know, it's been done. Or you know, mixtapes and there's all kinds of ways that hip hop can make money. And it's also really inexpensive to produce mostly. We're very future focused at Plutopia, uh, as you know, and I wonder what you see as as the future of music. Let's say five years out, where do you think we'll be with all this stuff? I have no idea, and I don't even really want to speculate um, uh, because it it doesn't really impact any of the plans I have for myself. Um, I've been doing this since I was sixteen, and um, I'm more interested in watching the industry now than in the actual art. And I'm watching an industry that basically is flailing around. Um, so if they ever get on their feet, it'll be because they figured out a way to move forward. But I really don't have any idea how that can be done. Uh, and as for the art itself, um, a lot of what I've heard in recent years has been really derivative and um, not not that interesting, but that could just be me because I, I could be burned out or, or I could be too old or something. I really don't know. Do you see differences in, in the music scene in Europe um, from oh, yeah. the U.S.? Uh, and I don't mean the music scene so much as the music business. Well, the music business here is still dominated by major labels and for the most part, and here I'm speaking mostly of Germany, where I actually know something about it. I haven't had any interaction with the music business in France. Um, they're completely clueless. They really don't know what they're doing. They've still got a bunch of money, but they don't know what to do with it or how to make any more. Um, the one thing that has saved the music business here has been the end of the domination of Anglo-American recording artists as younger people have learned to accept popular music in their own language, which is less of a problem in France than it is in Germany. In Germany, German language stuff was always, um, always had this tinge to it. Um, I had a friend who had a, um, a country rock band in Berlin I said so they weren't all that good as a country rock band, but they were people who knew how to play their instruments. 
And I, I just said to him, I said, why don't you do German stuff? Why don't you, why don't you do what Fairport Convention did and go back and find some folk music and do it electrically? And he just went pale because Hitler had co-opted German folk music and the whole idea of German folk music was just totally unthinkable. Totally oh my unthinkable. God. I didn't and realize this, that. And this translates, well, what better thing if you're a nationalist, you know? I mean, the National Socialists were nationalists. Yeah. And you do find this also in these extreme right-wing movements um, in contemporary Europe. But, um, but this kind of fear last well after the post-war era. I mean, it lasted 50 years after, and people just got terrified of, of doing anything in German. And then eventually a couple of bands, like there was a band called Element of Crime, who just said, you know, what's the, what is the most outrageous thing we can do? And they recorded an album in German. They were already big. And that they went into the German press and they said, we're not going to record any more English language stuff. And this really shocked people. But then they got used to it. And then also having the Easterners come on board, they were already used to uh, German language pop because who would record in English in East Germany? So eventually this combined with the rise of techno, which was something the Germans were very good at, even though it originated in Detroit with black people, um, you had these German acts that were doing very, very well. And whereas the ones with lyrics were only selling what they call the gas territories, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, um, the, the techno people were seeing international acclaim. And at last Germany had a pop music that it could call its own. So, but all of that happened outside of the major labels who were still trying to, you know, find the next Michael Jackson auf Deutsch. Well, yeah, the major labels don't want small and niche. They want major uh, sales, major mass sales. I, I would not call some of the electronic dance artists that I know in Germany, small niche people. Uh, one guy who I know is a former bus driver um, from um, Eisenhutstadt, who um, he makes millions of dollars. He's, he's had to endow a charity, in fact, so that his tax problem doesn't get too out of line. He and his wife have this amazing charity. His name is Paul Van Dyke. V-A-N-D-Y-K, just look him up on the on the internets and you'll see that he's he's just piling it in and he's, he continues to make very good records. Um, and, you know, th this has now been going on for at least 20 years, but he's done it all without any help from anything resembling a major label. Are there many like that? Yes, yes. In all the genres of European pop music, there are these days mostly people like that because too much of the majors work was to obey the people in London and LA. Um, I remember, you know, that the, the whole idea, I, I, some, some people I know got signed to RCA Germany and basically nobody cared because, in the company um, because they were too busy working acts that came to them already successful. You know, if you're working for Warner's Germany, what are you going to do? Try to get some band from Bremen airtime or work the new Rod Stewart album? Hello? That's not even work. So given the famous German work ethic, you know, it's pretty easy to see how that one's going to play out. You've been listening to the first in a two-part discussion with Ed Ward. Join us next time when Ed talks about the future of food. With John Dubkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.